Staniek Lukas is one of the country's best known architects. During the 1990s, he was part of Václav Havel's team revitalizing Prague Castle, and he still works in its monuments department. While as an author and journalist, he's done a great deal to popularize architecture in the Czech Republic. Our tour of Staniek Lukas's Prague is, in fact, a tour of his Letna, the leafy area he's always called home. We begin with a coffee at Café Alchemista, specifically in the lovely garden in the back. This is a fine place, I think. Uh, it was created about uh, 10 years ago, and uh, what is wonderful that there was a café, of course, inside, and also a museum of uh, café. But now we are sitting out of the building on the yard, where is a beautiful garden in the Japanese style. That's why real nature, we could listen singing birds and uh, also you could listen the water because there is a small pond here. This is place I love. And otherwise, apart from Café Alchemista, what cafes do you particularly like in Prague? There are many. Today, yeah, it's absolutely different situation from, a, I, I don't know, a communist period. city was dark and empty and no cafes and no bars. And so that's why the today's situation is much more better. Of course, it's not comparable. And I like uh, cafes with a specific atmosphere connected with interesting architecture because this is my job, the modern architecture. About this area, Letna, were all these streets built about the same time because they look similar? Yeah. One of the first buildings which was built here was uh, Academy of Fine Arts on the edge of Stromovka Garden. It was in the age of, in, in the beginning of, of uh, 20th century. It was finished in 1905, I think. Then all owners of apartment houses around, which were built later, added uh, something special. Uh, it means studios of uh, painters on the top floor and uh, studios for sculptors in the yards. And who lives at Letna? Are there still a lot of artists living here? I'm not sure that is comparable with situation in the beginning of century, last century, of course, where I think that about 95% of our, all uh, sculptors and painters uh, lived here within the era of Letna and had a studios here, like Mr. Stursa, Mr. Sukharda, Mr. Mazatka, Slavicek, I think very close from here. It's, I think behind the corner there were studios of these famous artists. It was absolutely different situation than today, but um, I think that some people still live here and uh, has some studios here, and that's why that we could meet some, some artists also, but not so many. I think today is a luxury part of city and uh, for artists it's not so, so easy to stay here, of course, and to pay the rent. I think the area is also connected with music, many musicians and also people like, for instance, uh, Yuri Czerny, who is a very famous uh, expert and critic of, of music, lives here also, or members of some uh, famous groups and so Mr. Mishik is my neighbor for instance and uh, many others. It's also area of, of music I could say. From Café Alchemista it's a short walk to Vegtral, a popular and lively local restaurant and bar with outdoor seating. It's perhaps 50 meters from the block where Zdeniek Lukas has always lived and the architect is a regular. This place I love because uh, this, this connection with, with people walking on the street and so the position is perfect. You are on the corner of the streets and the kitchen is uh, Spanish, what I know, vegetarian food and very good beer. We are on the corner of Keramitska and Chekhova. Chekhova. And Chekhova is where you have lived all your life, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I was born here in one end of the street and then I moved when I was 27 to another house. Number 29 I changed for number 17. I still hear from my childhood till today and I think it's good. It's very unusual to meet somebody who's lived all their life in the same place. What has it given you being always here? Of course uh, if you are still in one place the whole of your life, it means uh, to meet people around and to have fixed friends and uh, many possibilities here and uh, to stop uh, in your 
beloved pub after tennis match, for instance, or after a job, and so that's why that everything is stable here. What was your childhood like? Oh, it was fine. I think uh, many possibilities to play in the gardens and uh, also the house where I lived was very interesting. It was connected uh, with uh, the kindergarten and the kindergarten was connected with the studio of my father who was a sculptor. Everything was in one place only and uh, very interesting people and many artists. My father brought me very often to the studios of, of his friends in uh, many houses in this street and next streets. Were both of your parents sculptors or yeah, artists? Both, both of my parents were sculptors. My mother was, uh, she focused on uh, portraits of very interesting people I had chance to, to meet in my childhood. And uh, my father collaborated with architects. He made, uh, for instance, fountains or sculptures in the areas of, of schools or and other type of buildings and so. And tell us, what did it look like here when you were a child? I presume there were far fewer cars, for example? There are about six or seven cars in the street. It's absolutely not comparable with the situation. When I come in the evening, it's very difficult to find out a place where it's possible to park. There are only about six garages in this street. And we had a car also, very nice aero. It was a streamlined sport car owned by my mother. The colors were white and red and it was possible to open the roof. Also you were telling me a wonderful story earlier about how here at uh, Letenske Namiesti there used to be a police officer directing yeah. the traffic. Could you repeat that story? Yeah, yeah. There were no traffic lights and uh, they preferred uh, to have a man who could right the situation but the traffic is very complicated and yeah, that's why it's about six streets and that man was fatty and uh, he interrupted his work for a minute every full hour and stopped for a glass of beer in a nearby Podli Pame pub. It was fantastic to see him. And did the traffic get progressively crazier during the day as he was drinking? Were there more problems? No, by absolutely the no problems. He was something like a dancer among cars and trams and it was wonderful to see him. From Vegtrau, Mr. Lukash and I walk across the main crossroads at Letenske Namiesti towards Letenske Sadi, a long and extensive park overlooking the Voltava. There, on a windy early afternoon, he's scheduled to play a match on the clay courts of LTC, the second oldest tennis club in Prague. I played tennis here from my childhood till, I don't know, when I was 20, and now again, because my friend uh, is a uh, head of that club today, that's why that we could play every, every week, and this is a nice place, because we are on the edge of uh, Letna Garden, uh, you could see also the old tennis club, which is not in perfect condition now, but uh, it was built during 70s, wood, small wood cabin, we could say, with restaurant, and uh, it was created by famous Czech architect Bohumil Kozak. This is one of uh, wonderful places here in, in Letna, and uh, you could see also the opposite large, opposite buildings. One is a museum of agriculture, the second one is a museum of technology, and uh, this is also connected with my life because I worked there for 10 years in archives of uh, history of architecture. And you're telling me you went to secondary school just here? Yeah, and the secondary school is just behind the corner. This is also a nice modern building and uh, it was maybe the best period of my life. It was just around 1968. Everything ended with Russian occupation, of course. But uh, that period was very nice and uh, also a nice place. And uh, about uh, five minutes by walk from my house was also perfect. Everything is very close here in Letna. Also, not far from here, there was for some period a well-known or infamous statue of Stalin. Do you remember that time? Yeah, I remember from my childhood because it was destroyed in the year of 1962 when I was uh, eight years old. What was curious that there was a large space 
down the, the monument, uh, something like a big cellar, but originally they planned to create there something like a mausoleum of, of, of uh, our Czech leader of Communist Party, Mr. Gottwald with glass coffin. Then they decided to do it in, uh, in Witkov, and the place stayed empty, but was used as a storage of potatoes. <laughs> Very curious end of this idea. In 1962 they destroyed it and replaced with a flat part on the top without anything and this was then decorated during massive demonstrations against the communist regime in the end of 80s. The students created uh, the Bell of Freedom from plaster on the top and then it was replaced with, uh, with a pendulum measuring time of freedom which is still there. The Stalin statue was blown up it was enormous concrete. Do you recall the actual concrete and, destruction? And, and granite, yeah. The statue itself was created from granite blocks, but the pedestal was created from concrete, of course. And do you recall the actual destruction of the statue? I was out of Prague in that period, and when I turned back with my parents, <laughs> the space was empty. <laughs> it was a surprise for me because there were no official commentary. Nothing was in newspapers, yeah, and it was done during night, and the first attempt was not successful, only the knee and uh, the elbow of uh, that monument of Stalin was destroyed. They had a second attempt during the next night and then demolished everything. And I had a first possibility to get to the space under that monument uh, in the year of 1989, just after the revolution, and there is still a big pile of small pieces of stone and everybody of us of course try to find out anything like for instance bottom or finger or nose of Stalin but it was totally destroyed in very small particles that's why it was not possible to find out something like this. Well now that spot is occupied by this metronome which you mentioned. Yeah. Isn't there some connection between the metronome and Havel? No, I think that there was a connection between the Bell of Freedom, a student's uh, work there, and Havel of course because uh, when Havel was elected as a president, uh, the American president uh, George Bush Sr. came to Prague and he had a speech in Wenceslas Square and he brought a small model of uh, the Bell of Freedom. And the history is very interesting because the first Bell of Freedom, but very big one, was created in the beginning of 20s in the United States and sent to President Thomas Garrick Masaryk. And when I uh, started to work in Prague Castle at Mr. Howell's office, somebody sent me a letter because uh, that original Bell of Freedom disappeared somewhere during communist period and nobody knew where it could be. And uh, somebody, old lady, wrote me a letter that her father once mentioned, he was a builder, that he hanged this bell on the top of the tower of St. Anthony Church here in Holeshovice. And I climbed up the tower and I found the bell, which was covered with special painting to cover the inscription on the bell. Yeah, that's why that we had chance to find out the real Bell of Freedom from Woodrow Wilson sent to Czechoslovakia after 1918. And then uh, Mr. Bush uh, sent to Havel the small copy of this bell and this bell was right on the table of his office. And in that case, do you know how did the metronome come about? Was it produced by some artists? This metronome was created by artists, who Mr. Mr. Novak, who was professor of School of Applied Arts after 1989. And uh, that man created it as an advertising of uh, the show which was held in the Prague exhibition area in Bubenec. Uh, it was an anniversary of... Uh, big show of 1891 it means just after 100 years after yeah it was something like advertising of that show and i think that still if you see the pendulum there are inscriptions and one of these inscriptions could tell you the story that's connected with that show